Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel. Today we are looking at London Snow by Robert Bridges. We're going to do an analysis, we're looking at the language, the structure and a summary. So firstly, Robert Bridges. Robert Bridges was a poet laureate from 1913 to 1930. His poems often reflect a deep Christian faith. So in London Snow, some of the words that we see, heavenly, unheavenly, he talks about St. Paul, says Paul's Dome, and he uses the word manna, which we will come to when we look uh, into some of the sections of the poem. We'll analyse them a little bit further. He wrote many famous hymns. London Snow was wrote in 1890, and it tells how London is transformed by the power of nature from that link with manna, which, we, like I said, we will come to, a gift from God. So, summary, it's describing early morning London and the reaction of the people with the snow. He talks about himself in first person, so it's a first person narrative, and what he sees and hears, for example the schoolboys playing, the men waging war. In the final section, he describes the brown of humanity returning to the snow and the sombre men walking to their places. It's a circular narrative. It starts with the London as brown and then treading the long brown paths at the end. So it is presented in a circular narrative. There is the poem. Uh, we will have, I uh, will read through it now. If you want to fast forward, you can fast forward. You don't have to listen to it, but here is a poem. When men were all asleep and snow came flying, in large white flakes falling on the city brown, stealthily and perpetually settling and loosening, lying, hushing the latest traffic of the drowsy town, deadening, muffling, stifling, its murmurs failing, lazily and incessantly floating down and down, Silently sifting and veiling road, roof and railings, hiding difference, making unevenness even, into angles and crevices, softly drifting and sailing. All night it fell, and when full inches seven, it lay in the depth of its uncompacted lightness. The clouds blew off from high and frosty heaven, and all woke early for the unaccustomed brightness of the winter dawning, the strange unheavenly glare. The eye marvelled, marvelled at the dazzling whiteness. The ear hearkened to the stillness of the solemn air. No sound of wheel rumbling nor of foot falling, and the busy morning cries came thin and spare. Then boys I heard, as they went to school, calling, they gathered up the crystal manna to freeze, their tongues with tasting, their hands with snowballing, or rioted in a drift plunging up to the knees, or peering up from under the white mossed wonder, Oh, look at the trees, they cried, oh, look at the trees. With lessened load, a few carts creak and blunder, following along the white, deserted way. A country company long dispersed asunder, when now already the sun, in pale display, standing by Paul's high dome, spread forth below, his sparkling beams, and awoke the stir of the day. For now doors open, and war is waged with the snow, and trains of sombre men, past tale of number, tread long brown paths as toward their toil they go. But even for them a while no cares encumber, their minds diverted, the daily word is unspoken, the daily thought of labour and sorrow slumber, at the sight of the beauty that greets them, for the charm they have broken. So already as reading through, we say the repetition, we say the personification, there's quite a few techniques, we will touch on some of them in this analysis. So the structure, it's in one long stanza. It's a first person narrative. It's 37 lines long. There's a regular rhyming pattern. A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, C. However, there is one or two misplaced words. There's the use of enjambment. The enjambment the flow from line to line. It brings a kind of the sense of story, of repeating, of telling a story. There's repetition of ing words, which creates that half rhyme feeling. And that circular narrative, the brown city in the opening to the end, the treading of long brown paths. Some of the language. Well, notice here's a new technique that many GCSEs, you may not have studied this yet. Anaphora. It's a form of repetition at the start of a line or a verse or a sentence. So where we see repetition at the start it's known as anaphora so in this case when he's talking about the children playing or rioted in a drift or peering from under so we need to think what is Bridges 
using the repetition, the anaphora to emphasise. It's emphasising the fun, the excitement of the children. Maybe the children have never seen snow before. Maybe this is the first time and there's lots and lots of activities and thoughts going on in the head. So we get that feeling of excitement from the anaphora, the repetition of the word or at the start of the lines. From lines 1 to 9 there's lots of personification which we will look at in one of the next slides. The crystal manor lines in 19 to 30. So crystal manor is a reference to the Bible, a biblical reference. We will come to that shortly. And there's some metaphors. Calls the snow white moss wonder. So moss, a kind of a green, um, like a plant that we see when moss goes everywhere. It's, it, it connotes dampness, but a white moss wonder. So this white moss. This, it's covering the ground and he tells of how the men wage war when they go to work they wage war against the snow against nature it's full of imagery the trains of somber men at the end we create this image of all the men leaving the houses and going to war, uh, going to work walking in long lines like trains he talks about the sparkling beams but imagery is presented throughout lots and lots of imagery so Let's go some of the lines, through through the lines. Lines 1 to 9. It came flying, hushing the latest traffic. So two quotes there. The personification suggests that it's not man's choice, suggests that the snow is, has a mind of its own. It came flying. It was hushing the latest traffic. The snow is like a being. It's coming to London. He says large white flakes. The use of the word large suggests it's going to cover the city that we know is usually brown. In this era, of the 1800s, 1700s, London was known for being a dirty city. Okay. Uh, however, snow equals the purity. So it seems out of place. Snow, this pure, pristine snow is out of place in London. There's lots of verbs. It's full of verbs. Sifting, floating, drifting, sailing. If we just think about them verbs, they create a gentle and calm feeling. From lines 10 to 18... We know that there's a lot of snow. He says a full seven. He's talking about seven inches of snow. It's been a lot of snow. However, it still manages to lay on the ground with lightness. So although there's a lot of snow, it's still light. It's still gentle. The city has undergone a transformation. Whiteness. It is quiet. We hear, He talks about sound. He says the ear hearkened at the stillness. So we ha we create this really pristine, beautiful, white city. The morning cries are thin and spare. So this is not usual. This is not the norm. This is something different. A gift from God. Lines 19 to 30. Bridges starts. He changes here. He's, he's describing in the start, but now he starts using the personal pronoun. And we say I. So we see it from his perspective. He tells us what he sees as he walks through London. He tells about the boys playing in amazement. He calls the snow manna. Now this is the manna reference. It's a biblical reference to God. Now God provides food in the Bible to the Israelites. The snow, therefore, is a benefit no one was looking for. It's a gift from God. There's that biblical reference. Remember Bridges writes very is very Christian. So manna was a gift from God. The snow, therefore, is he's saying these beautiful natural events are gifts from God the landscape is beautiful and illuminating lines 31 to 37 the end we have or we've heard about the purity of the snow and the magical moments they're coming to an end the language changes war is waged with the snow the trains of somber men the use of the word somber sad and somber men this is a reminder of the reality of the city the dirt the snow is returning to brown so, however happy the initial tones, it returns close, it looks into the minds of the men, uh, and when he does look in the minds of the men at the end, they don't look as desperate. Although they haven't to go to work, they've got the somber facial expressions, the snow has had some effect on them. It has made their day, their thoughts at this moment a little bit lighter. So, the poem is a gift, the snow is a gift from God. Uh, it's changing the dirty city although with the circular narrative of the word brown at the beginning brown at the end it doesn't last long London snow how God how nature can make change and bring brightness even to the darkest and the dullest and the dirtiest of city